Hi, this is David Bonner Turtle continuing with a CFA Level 1 review of financial statement analysis and then specifically ratio analysis. We've previously looked at activity ratios and then in the last two videos, liquidity ratios and solvency ratios. And now we can look at liquidity and solvency as from the defensive perspective or from the perspective maybe of a lender concerned with the long-term health of the firm or its short-term ability to meet cash. So we shift from a defensive perspective to more of a proactive perspective from that of an investor who would be concerned with the profitability of the firm. Lots of different ratios here, but CFA level one, we're going to divide those into two buckets, return on sales and return on investments. Return on sales is going to only use the income statement. And then return on investment is going to be an income statement divided by a balance sheet measure. So I would just note that ROI, we see this term a lot, but it's really a bucket. ROI by itself is not specific enough because we have at least a dozen different flavors of that. So ROI itself needs to be defined. As usual, a stylized income statement and balance sheet for just a hypothetical case study. By stylized, I mean a lot of these line items have been omitted. But if we take this company here with a top line or revenue of 100,000, so is the income statement, so we know it's a flow as opposed to a stock. So it's over a period of time, this would be the fiscal or calendar year. Then revenue minus the cost of goods sold, so we call that COGS sometimes. And then we're gonna subtract COGS from revenue to get gross profit. And then we're gonna subtract operating expenses from gross profit to get income from operations. So that's why I've indented these because there's, we subtract COGS, then we subtract operating expenses. So the COGS are gonna to tend to be the direct costs of manufacturing the product. And then the operating expenses are gonna to tend to be the indirect costs. For example, sales, general and administrative or overhead, things that can't be directly attributed to product. So these are also gonna to tend to be fixed and these are also gonna to tend to be variable. After income from operations, we would deduct the interest expense. So that's interest that the company's paying on its loans or bonds, basically debt obligations. And then we'll have income before tax, also called pre-tax income. So in this case, let's say 20,000, and we'll assume a tax rate of 30%. That's in red because you wouldn't see it really on the face of the income statement typically, but just to show that we're using a tax rate of 30% produces a tax expense of 6,000. So we take the pre-tax income minus the tax expense of 6,000 and gets us the net income, which is sometimes colloquially called the bottom line. Usually when they say the bottom, we say the bottom line, it's net income after tax, just like the revenue tends to be the top line. And then in terms of my balance sheet, very stylized, meaning most of the numbers are not there, I'm not including the current assets, not including the long-term assets, but we're just gonna assume that the total assets, book value, really net um, assets, book value on the balance sheet are 150,000. And we know that the left-hand side needs to match the right-hand side. So I'm just gonna assume that we have current liabilities and then debt of 50,000 such that there's equity of 50,000. So you know there's another 50,000 in here that we're not showing. Equity is gonna be our residual. And so this is gonna be a classic case of a simple capital structure with two classes, just debt, just equity. Debt is the source of funds provided by um, the bondholders or lenders, and then equities can be source of funds or source of capital provided by shareholders. So then for those first four ratios, there's four ratios, but it's really almost one idea. We're just gonna move down the income statement, and in each case, the denominator is the revenue. So the gross profit margin is gonna take gross profit, in this case of 40,000, and divide by the revenue of 100,000. It's almost a common sized ratio approach. And so in that case, we've got 40%. And so this is usually of keen at, um, interest to analysts because it reflects here the profitability and pricing power of the company. For example, just yesterday, Apple announced its really uh, stellar results, results for the quarter, and it included a 44.7 gross margin, its highest in 15 years. 
just really reflecting or confirming its pricing power in the marketplace. So now we're going to move down the income statement to operating profit margin, but again, this is a return on sales metric. Sales is synonymous with revenue for this purpose, for our purposes here. Um, but we still got the same revenue on the denominator, but this time we're going to subtract, uh, use operating income in the numerator or income from operations. And also sometimes we call that earnings before interest and tax because notice it's before interest, before tax, or to say that in a short way, EBIT, not EBITDA. EBITDA is a little higher. This is EBIT. And so in this case, we're going to take the 30,000, divide it by that same revenue of 100,000, and we get 30%. And so you can see we're moving down the income statement. So these return on sales should, by definition, be getting lower and lower. That's okay by itself. We usually compare it to history or to peers. And then the pre-tax margin is 20,000 income before ta tax. We're going to use for the numerator. And notice we could also call that earnings before taxes. Notice this was EBIT, the I for interest, but this income before taxes after the interest expense. So it's not, it's going to be EBT, not EBIT. So income before tax or pre-tax income divided in that same revenue gets us 20%. So we're calling that pre-tax margin. And as you can see now, the idea of margin, the idea, the term margin really reflects that we're computing ratios. And then finally, all the way down on the income statement, net profit margin is going to use that bottom line or the net income, in this case 14,000, and divide it by that revenue of 100,000. And of course, it's lower. 14% for a lot of industries, this would really be a phenomenal uh, net profit margin, although it really depends on the, uh, the industry and sector generally. Finally, we'll look at the two primary ROI ratios, which is first return on assets, where now our denominator is total assets or specifically average total assets because now with these ROI measures, we've got a return over a period of income statement flow divided by a balance sheet account, which is point in time. So we really want to average between the beginning and the ending period. And we've got average total assets, in this case, 150000 And then for we want the return on those total assets. So we've got the net income here of 14000 And then we get to my favorite rule of ratios, which is ratio consistency. Total assets are financed by both debt and equity, lenders and shareholders, if you like. Net income is the residual claim that accrues just to the shareholders. So we're really not being ratio consistency or really leaving out what the lenders earn if we only include the net income. So we're going to use total assets. We're referring to everything on the left-hand side and therefore everything on the right-hand side. We've got the return to the shareholders. We need to add the return to the lenders. Further, net income is after tax. And so to add apples to apples, we want this interest expense to be not the 5000 that is pre-tax, but we want to multiply it ourselves manually here to confute this pre-tax interest expense into an after-tax interest expense. So we're adding an after-tax income, which is the return to shareholders, plus an after-tax interest expense, which is a return to the lenders. And that gives us our total after-tax returns to the total financial um, of, of total uh, all classes of financial capital. And now in this case that'll get us 11.6% and we could call this therefore an after tax ROA. And it's okay to also do a pre-tax ROA because in this case we start from the bottom really and build our way up. But we could just go right to um, the EBIT earnings before interest and in tax or what we call here operating income or income from operations. It's a little bit contaminated because there are other things drip out of it, including the tax, but it is pre-tax and it does represent a claim that's prior to the returns to both lenders and um, shareholders. So that this could be a pre-tax ROA, and of course it's gonna be higher. In this case, 30,000 divided by 150,000. And finally, return on equity. So this is a popular measure. It's flawed because it can be 
dr uh, driven up just by leverage. It therefore is not naturally risk adjusted. But notice it is ratio consistency. That's the key thing to keep in mind. We're interested in the returns to the shareholders. And so where is that on the income statement? Well, really on an after tax basis, it's really just the net income. In this case, 14,000 into just the uh, equity of 50,000 or 28%. So that's a quick review of the two common ROA and ROE that are both as part of that general class of generic return on investment ROI, which really we need to be specific about what we mean when we say ROI. So this is David with Mike Turtle. Thanks for your time.